Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Right, here we go. What you think about. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm thrilled you can join us. And I hope you liked our opening music. It's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band featuring Maya Door. And you can download that on any of your favorite music platforms if you'd like. For those of you that are new, Alzheimer's Speaks, we are really all about sound information, not just sound bites. We like to talk to people in the trenches who have experienced living with dementia and who have experienced what what everybody experiences during life. And so today we're going to have a really interesting conversation with Richard Morgan, who is the author of Light of Setting Sun. But before I um, introduce Richard, I want to just remind our audience that, you know, maybe you can be our next guest because everybody is welcome here on Dementia Uh, or on uh, Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. And I also want to let you know that today's show is a live show. So if you're listening and you have any questions or comments, feel free to call in at 323-870-4602. Now, um, I'm a big, uh, big, big fan of the Memory Cafe. So I want to give a shout out to Arthur Senior Living. We do two memory cafes a month on the second and the fourth Wednesday at one o'clock central. So that's two Eastern, uh, that's noon mountain time and 11 a.m. for those that are uh, Pacific time, but anybody in the world can join us. We also do one with uh, Artist Senior Living of of, um, Woodbury on the third Wednesday of the month at the same time. If you're interested in either of those, you can reach out to me or you can go to the memorycafedirectory.com and find all the memory cafes. Um, And if you click on their tab, uh, Cafe Connect, you'll find those that are now virtual. And there's about a hundred of them now that are virtual and they are all a little different. So go ahead to memorycafe.com or memorycafedirectory.com and check them out. You also might be really interested in our new global resource directory called Dementia Map that we just launched. Again, that's at DementiaMap.com. Not only does that serve those with dementia and their families, but professionals are finding this as a great resource as well. We're just growing it organically, but um, activity and interest has just been phenomenal. We'd love to have you join us in that journey. So go to DementiaMap.com. And then, of course, uh, music and I think faith are just such big pieces in people's life. And Coral Health, that C-O-R-O Health, is allowing people to um, download two of their apps for free. One is Music First, and the other is Coral Faith. Um, And you can do that now free during the pandemic. Go to Coral, C-O-R-O health.com. We're going to hear from the Footbar Walker, and we will be right back with Richard Introducing Morgan. the life-changing Footbar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Footbar Walker revolutionized my care of George. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. The Footbar Walker opens and closes just like a standard walker. The only thing that is different is the top bar and the foot bar. Does that ever 
sure make a difference. Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up, and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. Well, welcome back. I just love that Foot Bar Walker. If you know of anyone needing assistance, it really makes a huge difference in the life of not only the person in need of using it, but the care partner. Um, so go to the footbarwalker.com for more information on that. It's, it's quite, uh, quite a beautiful um, thing that was developed by two friends for two friends. So let me introduce you to Richard L. Morgan. He is a retired teacher and a chaplain and an author on spirituality of aging, uh, spiritual care of dementia, and life in your 90s. He lives in a personal care residence um, in uh, Redstone, and he today is going to be talking about his new book that is coming out March 1st called Light of Setting Sun. So welcome, Richard. I'm I'm just so excited to have you back on the show. You've been on before, and you are always filled with such brilliance and light. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> now, um, I always ask this one question before I kind of get okay. into my line of, line of questions, and that is, have you been personally touched in your own family or circle of friends um, by someone living with dementia? Oh, yes. Uh, my former wife, who died just a few months ago, had early dementia. And I spent almost 40 years working with people with dementia in memory care in two different uh, facilities. So I've had a lot of experience with uh, dementia, both with my wife and as a caregiver. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Now sure. I want to I want to talk to you uh, today. Uh, kind of focus on your book, uh, Light of Setting Sun. Good. And I, I want to know why did you decide to write this book, and how how do you think it's unique and different from a lot of other books on aging that are out there? Well, uh, <clears throat> back in 1991, I wrote a book called No Wrinkles on the Soul when I was only 61, because then I was dealing with the early issues of aging. Well, now it's 30 years later. I'm, I'm 91, and I was 90 when I started to write the book. And I realized that there were hardly any books that dealt with the spiritual, emotional issues of being 90. And only one book I found that was very helpful by Fritz DeLang called Loving Later Life. And in fact, he wrote an endorsement, which will be in the book, so I was motivated to write about what it was like from within. In other words, uh, most gerontologies who, gerontologists who study uh, age 90 do so as observers, and they're in their 50s and 60s. But what makes this book unique is this is an inside report written by someone who is 90 and how it feels to be 90 and how it's different to be 90 even the different than 60. So that's the why I wrote the book. Well, I, and I think that that is a great insight. You know, I've, um, I've been in the, the realm of dementia now for, gosh, almost 12 years, and I just really have always felt that the true experts are those the ones going through it. And so, yes. you know, you're living and breathing it, and it it brings a whole different perspective to, you know, what is actually happening and how that feels um, right. to somebody. Um, why did you choose your title, Light of Setting Sun? <clears throat> well, it, they are the words from William Wordsworth, the poet. He wrote a, a poem called Lines Above Tinner Abbey in uh, 1794. And he talks about a presence which he describes as light of setting suns, among other things. And that came to me that I'm living now at a time of setting suns. I have major issues of older age. I, I don't have mobility. I have neuropathy. I use a walker. I'm, I'm very prone to, to strokes. I've had a few minor strokes. 
I've lost my wife. I've been displaced twice in the last six months. So you want to talk about the issues of aging. I've experienced them, not just, you know, talked about them from, with somebody else. So light of setting suns, but there is still light. Now, Lori, I like to say there are three temptations of older age, to whine, to recline, or to decline. <laughs> but I like to say there's a fourth, to shine, to shine with the inner life. And some of my friends gave me a great quote by Maya Angelou, no one can dim the light that shines within. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to show that even though there's what we call geriatric giants in much older age, there's also the possibility of inward growth, shining with the spirit, and living up into death. So it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom, okay? Mm-hmm. But can you repeat those four again for our audience? I, I love those. I think that that was really okay. cool. And my guess is people might have been trying to jot yeah, those down. The three temptations down. are to whine, that is to complain, mm-hmm. to recline, to sort of to give up on life, or decline. But for me, there is a fourth possibility, to shine, to shine with your inner life, with no frailty, no decrepitude can take from you. Mm-hmm. Shine. And, and, you know, it really concerns me that many older people are so much prone to the first three, prickly to decline. And I'm declining. I know that. Who knows? I'll be 92 soon. But still, my mind and my soul is very active. And I think mm-hmm. that's possible, even in this late stage of life. Yeah, I, and I think that's... Uh... I think that that's a brilliant statement, and it really, um, I think it applies to all of life at all ages and stages, and yes. I see a lot of people going through these um, phases or recognizing them, um, and sometimes they're not recognizing them, sometimes somebody else is pointing them up to them, um, especially through COVID, because we've We've all taken these new twists and turns in our life, and it was I know. it's 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 easy to whine and then let yourself decline when you're feeling isolated and alone, and um, you know just kind of melding into the moment and almost floating away from everybody instead of staying connected. But um, I, I like you believe we all have that inner shine, we have that light, we have that brilliance, we have that purpose. Yeah. Now, Lori, I have to. Uh, give credit to a Swedish gerontology named Lars Tornstam, T-O-R-N-S-T-A-M. He wrote a book on the theory of gerotranscendence. I know that's a big word. But what he was saying was, in a 10-year study of people from 75 to 100, he found that many of them had not succumbed to a negative view of life, but were very positive about being that old. And he found different characteristics of gero transcendence. That motivated me because where I formerly lived in independent living, I knew people who were gero transcendent. Mm-hmm. Not, you know, people who were from common walks of life, who had no real, you know, success in life, so to speak. But they were gero transcendent in the sense that they did not give in to what I call silent negativity which I think is a very terrible curse of old age, just to give up and wait to die, silent negativity. Tornstam found many of his people who, who he uh, viewed were very positive about later life and mm-hmm. found joy in later life. Yeah, I, I I agree with you there. I think we all have that ability. And in fact, Richard, I just wrote a comment um, responding to um, Linda Eberman, who said, hey, we're going to be listening, you know, on Facebook. And I said, I just love talking with you because you are such a bright light. I mean, just talking with you, it, just in these few minutes, I can feel your pro- positive energy. And it just has filled my soul. So thank you. Thank you very much. It's um, it's important for, I think, all of us to realize that we have that ability to lift others in just how we project our, ourselves. 
and, you know, how we deal with life. Because life isn't always pretty, and, and it never was, no matter what age you are, no matter what happened in terms of disease or relationships. You know, life has its bumps. And yet everybody still has this thing where it's got to be perfect and it's got to look pretty. And it's like, you know, it's the, to me, it's the, it's the ugly, icky things that make us grow and make us better in the long run if we allow it to teach us those yeah. lessons. See, this becomes almost like a mission for me because there are 4 million people today who are 86 or older. But in the next 30 years, there will be 10 million people who, are, who will be living 86 on up into 100. So, again, this is a great time not to give up or give in, but to live fully, even though, you, as you say, you may have a lot of uh, issues, of chronic issues which come in, in those later years. But this could be a growing population, believe me, of people who are living much longer. It's the longevity revolution. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's that whole resilience of, of the process, you know, <laughs> and and I think yeah. that that's really neat, uh, and I think it's important too. And I, I like to believe that we are awakening a little bit more as a society, um, because there's so. always been, there's always been so much stigma around aging, you oh, know yeah. what it looks like, what it is, and I mean I I always since I was little I never really understood that because in our family. Um, aging looked very different. I had um, three aunts and a grandma, and, you know, one was a businesswoman, always in her dress and wore her pearls. Um, one was just a comedian. She was just slapstick funny. Another yeah. one you, you would say is was probably more of a, a, spintress, a spintress. And then the um, and then my grandma, she was just kind of your typical grandma, baking food, wearing the aprons, you know, and, and doing the household stuff. And so I right. never understood kind of those categories or roles that people seem to slot everybody in because that's not how it looked in my family. But I know in a lot of families, it was a very negative thing. And yet I saw each of these women just in, in brilliant roles in their own lane. And right. um, and I'm hoping that the world is is coming around and, and seeing people for who they are, not who they think they should be or who they were told they should be. Yeah, yeah that's, that's one of the blessings of being uh, almost 92. That I, I'm like Mae Sarton, the poet, who said when, when she was 75, I'm more myself than I've ever been. And that's the way I feel about myself. I, in fact, I have a whole section of the book on be, being 90, be, what that means about myself to accept myself and to realize I don't have to please everybody, please anybody. I mm-hmm. just am, I am who I am. And that's very free, freeing, freeing. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I... One of the things that uh, I want to point out is that people who are t- positive about later life, in my interviews I found, were less concerned about material things and were doing a lot of clearing out the clutter what uh, one woman calls death cleansing, and focusing on the spiritual life. That really appealed to me because, as you know, my whole life has been wrapped around spirituality. And mm-hmm. I found a lot more interest in that, in older, much older people who are in their late 80s and 90s, wanting to do more spiritual reading, doing more meditation. Uh, one of the... Uh, Prefaces to the book was written by Rick Moody, who's the author of the wonderful website, uh, Values in Human Aging. And he said most older people go through three stages about aging. First, postponement. Oh, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about getting old. But then when the reality hits them in their 60s, then they begin making preparations for their aging, both in terms of legal and other matters, but the last stage he calls pondering, and that's where I am. It's a time for the inner life to ponder, not to be busy all the time. In fact, one of my meditations about a, it's about a man named Howard who felt terrible because he said, I'm so useless. 
Well, I said, Howard, there is a time to be useless. But what he found was, sitting on his porch, he found that he could be of help to people who came and wanted just to want to talk. So the point is that it's okay to be useless. We live in a productive society where everybody focuses upon what do you do? What about who you are? Mm-hmm. You know? That's very important. And I, I find that very true in people who are what I call zero transcendent. They want, to, they want to deal with the inner life. They, they don't care about material things. And, and they don't need a lot of social activities, just a few friends. And, and, mm-hmm. and they want to ponder about the mysteries of life and of death. And I think that's an incredible time to be alive. I really do. Yeah, very, very neat. Um, I, I like that the postponing, the preparing, and the pondering. And I think the, I think the pondering is just such a beautiful space to be in. You yeah. know, um, it just you're allowing things to flow. Um, uh, it's very, very, very cool. I want to ask you, who is your target market? Because I, I think I know who it is, but I want to see who you say your target well, market is. Obviously people who are in their late 80s, 85 and older, who might want to hear from someone who's living about being 90, now 92. I think that's a market right there. Then mm-hmm. I think I think the baby boomers, who are, mm-hmm. you know, many of whom are starting to retire and who are going to live longer, I think we're going to extend life way beyond what it is now, thanks to medical science. I know the science can prolong life, but they can't tell you what it means. And then I think <laughs> another good market are uh, adult children who have aging parents. And I dealt with that in the book, talking about what what's the best approach for for for, 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 uh, for children, adult children with aging parents, particularly when some of the children are in their seventies and their aging parents are in their nineties. I mean, mm-hmm. That's a new issue. So that's I see as the market. Uh, people who are my age or a little younger, the coming baby boomers, the boomers, and adult children with aging parents. Okay, I can I can also see this um, just for younger kids in school, you know, college age and and things. I I just think that they are looking for answers when they're seeing that there's you know, something that's off. I mean, I just see that there's this searching. It seems like yeah. um, they're much more inquisitive and want to be, want to really be knowledgeable on things. So I see them as a real target um, market with this too, because they are, they seem to be evaluating life very differently um, and not just taking everything they hear for granted, but wanting to know the whys and the hows um, with things and so many of them are also being affected by, you know, parents and grandparents in terms of this whole aging process and some even, you know, great grandparents. Um, and so I think it's really important for them to, to understand what, what that all means. I'll never forget, uh, Richard, I was, uh, this is when I was still selling real estate. So this was a long time ago. And I started a program called Classic Lifestyles that helped the senior and their families kind of get on the same page. And I had a social worker call me and ask me to do a class. And she's like, Lori, I don't want you to do the typical class you do. It's great, you know, but I, I really want you to get them to understand um, where their where their parents or grandparents are at because they're just really, really struggling with this. Right. And I said, oh, I can I can do that. That's not a problem. And so we we did a lot of um, experience. Ex- um, uh, experimental kind of games and they, you know, put gloves on and had to pick up money like big ski gloves and had to wear glasses and had to write with different tools and try to read. And we just, we just did all of these different things. And it was amazing because the class, I mean, I had several people just bawling their eyes out by the end going, Oh my gosh, I did not understand I had no idea how difficult this was for them. And here, you know, I've kind of been riding them, and I had no idea the pain it caused or the difficulty because of arthritis or because of, 
loss of hearing or sight or and they they felt horrible but they were really a, a very appreciative to learn what physically was going on and how that could affect somebody emotionally as far as wanting to engage with others and stuff. Um, so I think you've got great potential with this book on many, many levels. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, talking about uh, adult children and aging parents, I speak from experience because what I, what I try to say in my book is that we who are older should not tell our children, you, you owe us. A debt. In other words, uh, you cared. I was cared for by you when I was young. Now it's your turn to care for me. No, I think what the best approach is to form friendship between adult children and aging parents. And I experienced that. We uh, we lived just we lived for 17 years, only a few minutes from our daughter, and she was wonderful. And when my wife died, I was really, you know, I had no family. I'm living in a, in a new situation. We know any people I really know are the medical staff. But Anna has been a great help to me. She's been a friend. She, 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 she not only meets my needs, you know, but she, she's been my friend. And I think that's the approach that, that uh, adult children need with their aging parents. Not that this is a burden or the older person saying, you owe me, don't put me in a nursing home. Just become friends. And I've mm-hmm. experienced that. And it's a wonderful thing when that happens. See, well, I have two it, sons. One's in California. Uh, he works for 3M, by the way. He goes to Minneapolis a lot. And another's in North Carolina. So Anna's my only family member close by. Mm-hmm. Well, and it is beautiful to be able to see the a different side of a relationship too instead of i you know i experienced that with um with my mom with dementia um as she progressed and and declined um i was able to see her kind of in a childlike state and people were like well, wasn't that upsetting i'm like it was the most beautiful thing i had had experienced because she she was so free you know she was just oh, yeah. so innocent and she was so joyful and to be able to see my parent like that and experience that with them, uh, that was uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful gift. So part of it is, you know, switching our mind frame of what we're told life is supposed to be like and what we're supposed to experience. And I think sometimes we put up roadblocks because of what we, uh, of the stigmas and, and what we think society expects us to be like and act like and and all of those things. Um, I wanted to talk to you, too, about the difference you see between waiting to die and living up until death. Because I think, you know, to me, those are like two opposite ends. That's a good question, but that's a tough, tough question. Mm -hmm. Um, Because of the pandemic, even before I was quarantined, trying to visit uh, people uh, here, many of whom are very nice and good people, but all they told me was, you know, I'm, 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 this, this pandemic has made me feel there's no more life left for me. I'm just waiting to die. Mm-hmm. There are people who have that approach when they get to be 85 and older. And, you know, the old saying is, Lord, why has the Lord left me here so long? And I can relate to that. Um, when my wife died, we had over four decades of a happy marriage. And, you know, I, I had that feeling of how these people feel when, when they're waiting to die. But on the other hand, the most important thing for me, and I think for other people of my age, is living up to death. What a difference. Living mm-hmm. up to death. Meaning, yeah, we're beset by so many problems and vicissitudes, but we need to live up to death, whether it means creating you know, whatever you can, what's, what's, listening to music, reading books. And the main thing is, I have found, is you live up to death if you still have a purpose in life. Mm-hmm. Sit around and watch television, no wonder life has no meaning. And for me, it's important to have a purpose. Now, when I first came here, it's been back in October, uh, I was able to go out and visit people here. 
uh, in personal care. And that was, for me, for them, it was wonderful because I was a silent listener to their stories. Mm-hmm. But for me, it was so gratifying that I still had a purpose. And when I was down in what they called supportive living before my wife died, there were people there with dementia. And so I could continue that ministry, which I'd begun way back in, in 1960. And mm-hmm. that gave me a purpose, you know, to be there for them, to listen. And I think mm-hmm. that's the main difference between waiting to die, no reason to live, and having a reason to live, live up to death. That's important. What do you think? Oh, very. I think that's very important. Um, I I mean, I have found that throughout my whole life. And, um, you know, even when I when I switched careers, which I never, I never in a zillion years thought I would do, people thought I was nuts. And yet... Um, when I switched into this arena of, of dementia, um, you know, it was a huge risk. It still, it still is you know, on a lot of levels compared to, you know, I had a stable salary and, and things were uh, very, very comfortable. Um, and some people thought I was having a nervous breakdown, but it was like, this, this is my passion. Um, this is my purpose. This is where I'm supposed to be. And it might not be, it might not look like, you know, your, your life, it doesn't have to be. Um, But everybody I think has, you know, can, can find their purpose, but I think so many block it out because they're afraid of what other people might say about going down that path. What you're doing, you certainly do have a purpose with your wonderful thing on the Alzheimer's Speaks. I mean, that, that has blessed a lot of people more than you will ever know. Yeah, it's um, it, it's kind of been a, a little miracle baby, you know, in its own way. And, I know. and you and you kind of look and go, well, how did that happen, you know? But it really is it's it's like a God thing. It's a very spiritual thing. It's and not that I haven't wa- wanted to give up. I mean, I've had my shouting matches with God and saying, hey, something's got to change here. <laughs> you know, if you want me to keep doing this, I want to do this, but this is too much stress. You know, I I need this I need this to fall in line and. And, uh, you know, we have our conversations and then it'll be ding in my email or the phone will ring or something will cover that, you know. But every now and then I have to kind of spout out. It's like, okay, my prayers aren't getting through. So I'm going to have a little shouting match with myself and God. (laughs) And then that kind of clears the air and and I'm moving forward. But I, you know, as tough as times get sometimes working your passion, it doesn't out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see, the people that I found, particularly over in North Huntington, where I lived for 17 years, who had not given up or given in to negativity, but were living really up to death, I think of Dorothy. Dorothy was writing prayers at 99, and, and mm-hmm. she was doing a prayer at 100. And she wow. was just, just, a, just a nice lady who was a very devout Roman Catholic. In fact, I have one of her prayers in the book called God's Holy Light talk about, we talked about light, she, she really shone with the light, I think of her I think of uh, another lady who was married to a pro- seminary professor, traveled around the world with him and she's 90, 90 and she would share her experiences and her knowledge in groups, and that to me was a wonderful thing because I hadn't been to those places where she had been I learned a lot from her you see, she still had a purpose, didn't just sit around watching television. Mm-hmm. And then I think of one of my wonderful interviews, which happened years ago when I was uh, in North Carolina. I visited the Cherokee, uh, uh, the Cherokee, Cherokee place in North Carolina. Uh, and it was a reservation, but I was very disappointed that I, in the, in the Native Americans that I tried to talk to about wisdom, but I drove him back into an old country road, found a woman sitting on the porch, and I went and listened to her. She said, I don't know how old I am. I know I'm, they tell me I'm 90. But when her parents hid from, you know, when they moved, in the Trail of Tears moved the Native Americans west, they hid, they hid, and she still lived in that same home with, with it, which they had built. And full of wisdom, you know, she used to sit around the fire and listen to the Native Americans share their wisdom, and she had 
I learned much from her. She had a purpose to share that wisdom. Unfortunately, she told me, nobody listens to me anymore, none of the younger generation. And I said, how sad. It really was, because I learned a lot from her about Native American beliefs. Mm-hmm. So I think of people like that, and I think of others that showed me that the light still shines in the darkness. Yeah, oh, I I definitely, definitely agree. And there's there's so much, like you said, wisdom to be shared and to be learned. Oh. And um, I, I think... Um, and and I've always been like this since I was really little. I I just loved being around my elders, and I think yep. part of it was was because there was this peacefulness. It wasn't as it wasn't it wasn't so crazy busy. And I'm 61, so you know you look back when I was a little kid, life wasn't even near the pace it is today. I know. But I but I felt this peacefulness, and I think my grandkids for the most part, feel that with me too. You know, it's just a place where they can slow down and breathe and just um, just be and, and be engaged. Um, having you know, someone who, who really takes the time to be with you. you know, with Eric Erickson, he said, wisdom is experience well digested. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is so true. Yeah. Wisdom is experience well digested. And these, well, in fact, there's a tribe in Africa, the Yoruba tribe, that calls their elders wisdom people. I love that. Not old people, not even, you know, aging people, age, wisdom people. And they believe, as as I just said, the older people have wisdom that needs to be shared with the younger generation. Well, it's it's an honored position to achieve. Where, I mean, you, you look up, I mean, um, that's one of the things I did when I would go into the schools and talk about aging. We would, um, I'd have them shout out, you know, when you think of an older person, what do you think of? And, and the words, we'd look at the dictionary. And, I mean, they were all derogatory. They were all something nobody really wanted to be called. Right. Exactly. And yet, And yet we still use them to this day. I, I love, I, I love the word wisdom. I think that's... Um, we have to get back to honoring people, no matter who they are, no matter what they're going through, um, at all ages and stages of life. And I think we've really drifted apart from that. And I think your book is something that can teach um, a lot of different generations on how to come back to the middle and really appreciate one another and what each of us has to offer. Because, you know, if we were all clones, it would make for a pretty boring life. Right. And And I think sometimes people forget that. <laughs> you know, it's um, it's important nope. to to learn, you know, continually learn um, from the experience of life. Let's talk about some of the realities and mysteries at the age of ninety. Okay, of course, obviously the realities are the issues that face you when you are ninety, particularly uh, physical decline and other issues of displacement, loss. Uh, there's no question that's, that's going to occur. You'd be very fortunate if you could cruise and be in my on, on cruise control, but that doesn't happen. Somebody's going, so everybody's going to have some issue that faces them, and um, we just have to be aware of that. Now, mm-hmm. what was your question again? <laughs> oh, just what are some of the differences that you okay, see that's the regarding the realities? Yep. That face me. I mean, you know, I never thought. I never thought I'd end up like this, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm very, very, very limited, limited by having to live in a place with a personal care, but I get good care here. And I never thought that, that, that uh, I would outlive my wife. I thought it would be the other way around. But the mysteries are things that we ponder, as we talked earlier, about the importance of pondering, two of, two of which I deal with in the book. One is the old question of why do good people suffer? And that has become really a forefront question in the pandemic. I cannot, you know, we insisted, I told you we had eight people die over in, in the other uh, redstone, one of the other redstones. The pandemic has caused a, a lot of pain and suffering. And I often question, well, why? And, uh, you know, that's a mystery. 
I don't think well, I can find an answer, but I still think about it. And the other mystery, of course, is, is life after death. Uh, I gave some thought of that earlier, but now I think about that all the time. Um, I studied a lot of near-death experiences and uh, all the metaphors. So you sit around and you do ponder the mysteries. You don't get answers, but at least you can face them and say, this is something for which I have no, I have no, I have no, I have no answer. Mm-hmm. Life is yeah. not that simple. I wish it were. <laughs> That whole life after death is is an interesting one too. Um, you know, I bring up my, you know, the journey with my mom who lived with dementia for thirty yep. years, and and I really say it was a spiritual experience like no other. I didn't I didn't know the depths of a, that a relationship could have. I and to me it was it was totally spiritual. Um, the way we communicated at the end, I mean, we didn't have to use words anymore. She would actually come to me in dreams and people are like, well, that's kind of weird. And I'm like, it's pretty dang cool. You know, when you're getting messages, even when she was actively dying and stuff and telling me to, you know, I better finish writing her a bit because she wasn't going to stay around a lot longer or, you know, I'm, uh, you're not going to be here when I go. I need to know you're going to continue to work. And so when everything fell into place, I had two keynotes and I was gone, but she was with me the whole time. I mean, it was, wow. it was, it was just amazing. And even That's something um, to really cherish, you know, it, it really is. So I think, you know, opening up kind of our hearts and minds to what can be, what we can still feel, what we can still, uh, how we can still connect. Um, you know, and she's been gone since um, 2014, and I still feel her spirit around me sure. a lot. Oh, yeah. I still, still feel very um, connected, and and I know some right. people are are scared to even talk about that because some people will think, oh, that's kind I'm of not. voodoo. I'm not either. No, it's I'm so not. Beautiful. I mean, my Celtic background says that the death, the dead people are very near us. Mm-hmm. Their, their presence can be felt around us, and I believe that. Uh, my wife, I sense her presence almost every day. Uh, and I, I think that's important for, for those of us who are this old to, to, to know mm-hmm. that, that there is a, a relationship, a connection, as you say, between loved ones who have gone but still with us through the Spirit. And yep. what we call the communion of the saints. And, um, you know, it's still a mystery. I mean, you know, I... I've, I must have read 15 books on life after death. I mm-hmm. read one by a very liberal scholar named Bart Erdman, Heaven and Hell, waded through that book. And, and when I finished, I said, it's still a mystery. No one has the real answers of what yep. lies beyond. No one does. No, because you, once you're dead, you don't come back in, in a form exactly. that, you know, that, that we know. Exactly. So, yeah, it's... It's uh, it's very interesting, but I think of all the people who nonchalantly will say, you know, they saw an eagle or there was a penny or something, in the, and they'll say, this reminds me of so-and-so or so-and-so's around, but okay. they don't, uh, they'll let it slip. But you can see the peace that it gives them. And I, you know, I think, gosh, when we get those peaceful moments, we have to be proud. We have to let people know they're there, especially during right. COVID, because um, yeah. we're all looking oh, yeah. for peace. We're looking for calm. We're looking for love. We're looking for connection. And um, and I'm a firm a firm believer also, Richard, I don't know if you are, but that you're only going to find what you're looking for. So if you're looking for the negative, you're yeah, going to find exactly. the negative. But if you're going to look for the beauty and the connections, they're there. They're you there because I, I have sensed my wife's presence. For instance, rainbows come into my room. Wow. And, and, I mean, that's just to me a sign because I know – my former wife, Alice Ann, loved rainbows. I mean, that's a sign. People may think I'm crazy, but I think that's a sign. I really do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I deal with the mystery. It's it's there, but you can't help but think about it. Um, you know, uh, I recommend Fritz de Lange's book, Loving Later Life. He's an ethicist, and he mainly writes about the ethics of aging That when you're that old, when you're 85 and older. But he has a lot of good sections in there about uh, how you face these issues. And one sentence that he wrote 
as an endorsement for my book that's on the back cover, I think says it says a lot. Reading this book makes you less afraid of being very old and will fill you with curiosity and wonder about the mystery. Mm-hmm. That, that's a wonderful sentence. It really and then is. It says, being 90 stands for the embodiment of wisdom, growth, and inner vitality and transcendence. His book is wonderful, and I was very fortunate. I wrote him, and I had no idea he'd ever write back. And he wrote a very lovely letter, and he wrote an endorsement, which is on the back cover of the book. But I recommend his book. I have read that book many times. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, you had mentioned, a, and I just want to point this out, you said you have rainbows come into your room, and some people might yep. think you're crazy. Exactly. And I love and I love the wisdom of of age, of not caring anymore what other people think, but right. but going exactly. going for the peacefulness within, and knowing right. that that is way more important than what anyone can ever think of you, because right. you're the only one that can give yourself that peacefulness. And right. um, and the other thing I want to mention is um, again, you know, with my mom on her her dementia realm. She would, uh, at times, I think, she was talking to people who had passed. She was having conversations with people who had passed. Now, some people could look at that and say, she's crazy, get a PRN, she needs medication, she's hallucinating. And I, you know, I told the nursing staff, no, she's, she's at peace, she's happy. Why, why would we True. medicate her? She's not disruptive to anybody. And it was almost like she crossed the veil there um and 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 again some people might think i'm crazy for that and i don't really care that's my opinion you can have yours you know again Um, that's something from my celtic background about the thin veil mm -hmm. the veil between heaven and earth at times becomes very thin Mm -hmm. it can happen in places or it can happen with people just like like you said with your mother i mean I, i think that veil can become thin but we live in a thick world we don't want to acknowledge that the veil can become thin, but it, but it does. Yeah. I've ex- you know, one thing that uh, I wanted to, I guess what was on my mind to point out, oh, oh, that, that um, the book has a purpose in the sense that, as I said earlier, when you reach this age, now there's another book written by Thomas Cole called a country of old men, where he interviewed very significant people in all walks of life, and they all talked about their lives. What came through to me in that book is these men had a purpose in later life. Even though life had taken away a lot from them, they still had a purpose. And that's what I'm trying to say that to anybody who's my age or even young, a little younger don't give up. There's a purpose for you still. God has a purpose for you. I believe that. I do, too. I do, too. And, uh, you know, so often. Oh, go ahead. And it's amazing how what happens. There was a lady up in memory care in North Huntington who never spoke. She had serious Alzheimer's, never spoke. And I was with her as she was dying, and she began to pray, angel of God, my, my guardian dear, to whom the love of God appears. That was a prayer she had learned as a child. Mm-hmm. It was right there when she died. To me, that was the rending of the veil. I mean, she went to heaven saying that prayer. Wow. I'll never forget that. that. And that's a, such a beautiful, beautiful thing. I, I just think yep. that we really need to um, expand our our thought process and open our hearts to this world is much bigger um, than what we could ever imagine. And there's, there's a lot of possibilities out there, you know, for us to be able to, um, to experience. And, and again, you're, if you're not going to look for them, if you're just going to focus on the negative. You, know, you find one, what you look for. That's, that's, I'll remember that. Yep. And so, um, yeah, and so it's important for us to be conscious of what we're even looking for or what we're saying. Um, you know, I used to, um, as an example, I'll say I, when I would get into a frustrated mode when I couldn't find the answer to something, and I thought, I, I really thought I was looking for the answer, 
And then I would find out that I would get really mad sometimes. And I would have my little shouting matches with God. And and I'd say, what's the lesson? And then I realized, oh, my gosh, I wasn't looking for the answer. I wasn't looking for the lesson in this bundle of crap that rolled my way that I didn't want to experience. And when I when I started asking him what was the lesson, then I realized I have the power to look at what's the lesson. And I wasn't looking at what the lesson was. And then and then everything just kind of unfolded. And it was like, wow, this was really a powerful experience. Thank you. <laughs> you know? exactly. But I but I didn't uh I, I didn't see it at that because I wasn't looking at it in that in that light. And so, so much, I think, of our mindset um, makes up who we are and how we live and, um, you know, the energy that we expel, you know, to others and, and so, create in our own communities. If I could ask, are you in the boomer generation? Yep, yep, yep. I'll okay. be 62 in June, so. What's that? I'll be 62 in June, so. Great. That's a great time, a great time. That's what I wrote the book on No Wrinkles on the Soul when I was well. I, I love that title. I love yeah. that title. <laughs> but anyway, you have a lot to look forward to uh, many years ahead, and you will bring all that wisdom you have garnered into the to the later years of life. That's going to be a great experience for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, uh, I think that there's so many life experiences that people miss out on that they're not they're they're not cataloging them. They're not they're not appreciating their values sometimes because they're too busy being so fast paced, thinking that they're living life, but they're missing so much of it because of the pa- the pace that we live in nowadays. I think. By the way, I need to to add. I know our time's running out. That <laughs> I've decided that all proceeds of sales of this book will go to Redstone Benevolent Care. Redstone Benevolent Care provides uh, support for people whose money runs out, and they have a wonderful program of benevolent care. No one is ever kicked out of Redstone. Oh, that is wonderful, Richard. So I feel what like a... that's a, another ministry I'm offering to, the, to people who, whose money runs out, and who knows, mine will probably run out soon anyway. <laughs> but be that as it may, uh, I'm, I'm not accepting any royalties. You know, all go to benevolent care at Richland. I love that. I love that. That just shows, you know, again, the brilliance of your soul and your heart that you really walk your talk. I mean, you, you get the importance of caring for others and um, and what you can do. Now, how do people get the book, Richard? I saw that... Uh, uh, it'll saw... be available on mm-hmm. an upper room. Uh, best thing now, you know what's happened, Lori, is they shut down... The offices, they're going to lease the building. Everybody is working from home. Mm-hmm. So call 1-800-972-0433. That's the quickest way to get the book. Okay. Can you say that again? 1-800-972-0433. Yeah, okay. 0433. And then it's, it's also on Amazon. I was going to say, I thought I saw it on Amazon where people could uh, buy it as a um, as a pre-sale. And I also put on a link on the on the blog to, you know, all of your books that you've written because you've written a lot, a lot of books. Um, so I think people will be really impressed and might want to throw a few of those in their in their cart while they're shopping. So um, I can't thank you enough. Now, is it okay if people contact you directly through email? Yeah, I'll be happy for any phone call or any email. Do you have, and you have my email address? Yep, I have it as R L uh, Mogren author at oh gmail dot com. That's correct. They okay. can contact me there, or I would be glad for them to call because, uh, as I say, I'm really right now in a sort of an isolated situation. So any call is, is double me. Double meaningful. I need to pay tribute to two people who you know, Linda Everman and Don Wendor. They have been such a support to me. First of all, in writing the book, supporting me all through these moves I've had to go through and the loss of my wife. And I really appreciate Don and Linda more than I can say. Oh, they're just wonderful, wonderful. They really are. Yeah. What a, what a they, ministry they have. 
And see, Linda and I founded Clergy Against Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And that's through Us Against Alzheimer's, just in case anybody wants to know that. So, um, again, I'm just so thrilled that you're able to join us today. And, um, again, thank you so much for all the wonderful work that you've done and just being such a a bright light yourself and sharing yourself. Really appreciate it. I'm trying to shine with the spirit. (laughs) <laughs> Great. And so, again, the name of Richard's book is Light of Setting Suns, coming out March, but you can go ahead and call to order the book at 800-972-0433, or you can go on to Amazon and find that book there as well. Thank you all so much for your time. I hope you share this far and wide and enjoyed this show as much as I did. We'll talk to you next time. Bye now. Bye. Hey everybody, Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.